Excuse me, little dog. Hi, guys. It is a gray, gloomy, ugly day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization where we have woken up to this nasty... It is a Monday. I think Monday, October 17th, 2022, or something like that. So, uh, since I cannot do what I wanted to do today, since I'm trapped in the tiny house, you guys might be lucky. I might do several chronicles of the collapse, but this is the main one that uh, I wanted to bring you. This was actually the toss-up for my Sunday sermon yesterday. I went with... Uh, <clears throat> what did I go with? Oh, yes, Bill McKibben yesterday. Because uh, it's a little more sermon-like. But this was the one, was its competitor. So we're just going to run it today. And this is by several versions of this. You can find this on Tom Dispatch. You can find it on Common Dreams and not sure where else. I have... Uh, I believe I've read stuff by this fellow before named Stan Cox, but I think is maybe it's his wife. Someone else says uh, with the last name Cox is joined up. Uh, Pretty Cox. I'm going to stop right there. Pretty Cox. Imagine uh, <laughs> if your last name is Cox. Anyway, we're, we're not going to go there. And, uh, <laughs> at Collapse Chronicles. Okay, but, uh, Stan and Pretty, uh, asking the question, are green resource wars looming? There you go. We have a new term for the collapse of global industrial civilization. Green resource wars. <laughs> You know, all this talk about oil wars, you know, fossil fuel wars. And so it only makes sense that if we try to get all fossil fuels and all of this green, clean energy, we might as well have resource wars over them too. Are green resource wars looming? The burden of massive EV batteries will be borne by people and ecosystems. Now, this is a long, involved story. Since I have nothing else to do, I'm going to sit here and read it. I, if I were you, I would just go on the link and read it yourself. But if you want to sit around listening to this old doomer, read it for you, I'll be happy to. So take it away, Stan and Pretty Cox. <clears throat> Much of the excitement, yes, the excitement over the inflation Reduction Act. I know there's a lot of excitement everywhere I turn over the Inflation Reduction Act. Focused on the boost it should give to the sales of electric vehicles. Sadly though, manufacturing and driving tens of millions of individual electric passenger cars will not get us far enough down the road to ending greenhouse gas emissions and stanching the overheating of this planet. Worse yet, the coming global race to electrify the personal vehicle is likely, well, 100% likely, to exacerbate ecological degradation, geopolitical tensions, and military conflict. The batteries that power electric vehicles are likely to be the source of much international competition, and the heart of the problem lies in two of the metallic elements used to make their electrodes. Take a while to guess. Cobalt and lithium, although I know that nickel is somewhere on that list too. Most deposits of those metals lie outside the borders of the United States and will leave manufacturers here and elsewhere relying heavily on foreign supplies to electrify road travel on the scale now being envisioned. 
in the battery business, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is referred to as the Saudi Arabia of cobalt. For two decades, its cobalt, 80% of the world's known reserves, has been highly prized for its role in mobile phone manufacturing, probably in the manufacture of this computer too. Such cobalt mining has already taken a terrible human and ecological toll. Now, the pressure to increase Congo's cobalt output is intensifying on a staggering scale. Whereas a phone contains just thousandths of a gram of cobalt, one electric vehicle battery has pounds of the metal and a quarter billion such batteries will have to be manufactured, manufactured to fully electrify just the American passenger car fleet as it now exists. You know, this is just for America and not counting the rest of the planet's electric vehicles. Not surprisingly, the investment world is now converging on Congo's capital, Kinshasa, in a remarkable series of articles late last year, the New York Times reported on how the cobalt rush in that country has been caught up, quote, in a familiar cycle of exploitation, greed, and gamesmanship that often puts narrow national aspirations above all else, close quote. The most intense rivalry is between China, which has in recent years been buying up cold mi cobalt mining operations in Congo at a rapid clip, and the United States now playing catch up. Those two nations, wrote the Times, quote, have entered a new great game of sorts, close quote, a reference to the 19th century confrontation between the Russian and British empires over Afghanistan. <clears throat> fifteen, fifteen of 19 cobalt mines in Congo are now under Chinese control. In and around those mines, the health and safety of workers have been severely compromised while local residents have been displaced from, displaced from their homes. People sneaking in to the area to collect leftover lumps of cobalt to sell are being shot at. The killing of one man by the Congolese military at the urging of the Chinese mine owners spurred an uprising in his village, during which a protester <coughs> was also shot and killed. <coughs> the Times further reported, quote, troops with AK-47s were posted outside the cobalt mine this year along with security guards hired from a company founded by Eric Prince, close quote. If you can't remember who that is, Prince is notorious for having been the founder and boss of the mercenary contractor Blackwater, which committed atrocities during America's forever wars of the 2000s. Among other mayhem, Blackwater mercenaries fired upon unarmed civilians in both Iraq and Afghanistan and were convicted of the killings and woundings that resulted. Um, from 2014 to 2021, Prince was the chair of a China-based company Frontier Services Group that provided Blackwater style services to mining companies in the Congo. Prince has joined 
what the time call the times calls quote a wave of adventurers and opportunists who have filled a vacuum created by the departure of major American mining companies and by the reluctance of other traditional Western firms to do business in a country with a reputation for labor abuses and bribery, close quote. <clears throat> Forbes reported recently that 384 additional mines may be needed worldwide by 2035 to keep battery factories supplied with cobalt, lithium, and nickel. There's the nickel. Even were there to be a rapid acceleration of the recycling of metals from old batteries, 336 new mines would still be needed. A battery industry CEO told the magazine, quote, if you just look at Tesla's ambitions to produce 20 million electric vehicles a year in 2030, that alone, that alone will require close to two times the present global annual supply of those minerals. And that's before you include VW, Ford, GM, and the Chinese, close quote. Currently, the bulk of the world's lithium production occurs in Australia, Chile, and China. <coughs> While there are vast unexploited reserves in the southern part of Bolivia, <coughs> where it joins Chile, and Argentina. I think a bug has flown down my throat. Excuse me. Ah! Might be the last bug I eat at Bugs in My Mouth Farm. Alright, currently the bulk of the world's lithium production occurs in Australia. Good lord. <laughs> I needed to wash this shirt any. Anyway, Chile and China where there are vast, while there are vast unexploited reserves in the southern part of Bolivia, where it joins Chile and Argentina in what's come to be known as the Lithium Triangle. China owns lithium mines outright throughout that triangle and in Australia, and two-thirds of the world's lithium processing is now done in Chinese-owned facilities. Lithium extraction and processing <clears throat> is not exactly a green business. In Chile's Atacama Desert, for instance, where lithium mining requires vast evaporation ponds, a half million gallons of water in the single driest spot on the planet, the Atacama Desert in Chile, a half million gallons of water are needed for every metric ton of lithium extracted. The process accounts for 65% of the total amount of water used in that region and causes extensive soil and water contamination as well as air pollution. I'm not making this up. I, this might be a, a distillation from a chapter, I, I'm not sure, from uh, Stan Cox's new book titled The Green New Deal and Beyond, Ending the Climate Emergency While We Still Can. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, getting back to the lithium triangle and the Chinese, 
Well, we're going to talk about Elon Musk now. While evidently uninterested in Mother Nature, Tesla's electric car tycoon, Elon Musk is intensely interested in vertically integrating, integrating lithium mining with electric battery and vehicle production on the Chinese model. Accordingly, Musk has been trying for years to get his hands on Bolivia's pristine lithium reserves. Yep, yep, yep. When a Twitter user accused Musk of being complicit in the coup that I overturned Evo Morales, uh, um, it's Anyway, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to read the sentence. Until ousted in a 2020 coup, Bolivia's president, Evo Morales, stood in Musk's way, pledging to industrialize with dignity and sovereignty. When a Twitter user accused Musk of being complicit in the coup, the Tesla tycoon responded, we will coup whoever we want. Deal with it. He later deleted the tweet, I bet. As Vishay Prashed, and have I interviewed Vijay Prashed? And Alejandro Bejarano observed at that time, quote, Musk's admission, however intemperate, is at least honest you know, about how the global corporatocracy will coup whoever we want, deal with it, uh, is at least honest. Earlier this year, Musk and his company revealed that they wanted to build a Tesla factory in Brazil, which would be supplied by lithium from Bolivia. When we wrote about that, we called our report, Elon Musk is acting like a neo-conquistador for South America's lithium. Bolivia continues to seek to exploit its lithium resources while keeping them under national control. Good luck on that. Without sufficient wealth and technical resources, however, its government has, a, has been obliged to solicit foreign capital, having narrowed the field, field of candidates, candidate companies to six, one American, one Russian, and four Chinese. By year's end, it is expected to select one or more of them to form a partnership with its state-owned firm. No matter who gets the contract, friction among the three suitor nations could potentially kick off a Western Hemispheric version of the great game. And whatever you do, do not forget that Taliban-controlled Afghanistan, a lithium-rich land with centuries of bitter experience in hosting great powers, is another potential arena for rivalry and conflict. In fact, Soviet invaders first identified that country's lithium resources four decades ago. During the U.S. occupation of Afghanistan in this century, geologists confirmed the existence of large deposits of lithium, and the Pentagon promptly labeled the country, you guessed it, a potential Saudi Arabia of lithium. According to the Asia-Pacific-based magazine The Diplomat, the lithium rush is now on, now on there, meaning in Afghanistan, and quote, 
countries like China, Russia, and Iran have already revealed their intention to develop friendly relations with the Taliban as they compete for the chance to flaunt their generosity and help that country exploit its resources. But we're not done yet. The greatest potential for conflict over battery metals may not, in fact, even be in Asia, Africa, or the Americas. It may not be on any continent at all. The most severe and potentially most destructive future battleground may lie far out in international waters where polymetallic nodules, dense mineral lumps, often compared to potatoes in their size and shape, lie strewn in huge numbers across vast regions of the deep ocean floor. They contain a host of metallic elements, including not only lithium and cobalt, but also copper, which is another metal required in large amounts for battery manufacturing. According to a UN report, a single nodule field, a single nodule field, the 1.7 million square mile clarion clipper, clipperton zone, that's a big field, 1.7 million square miles, in the Pacific Ocean southwest of the Hawaiian Islands contains more cobalt than all terrestrial resources combined. A UN agency, the International Seabed Authority, issues exploration licenses to mining companies sponsored by national governments and intends to start authorizing nodule extraction in the CC zone as soon as next year. Mining methods for polymetallic nodules have not yet been fully developed or used at a large scale, but the metal hunters are advertising the process as being far less destructive than the terrestrial mining of cobalt and lithium. One can get the impression that it will be so gentle as not even to be mining as we've known it, but something more like running a vacuum cleaner along the seafloor. Don't believe that for a second in just one small portion of this giant nodule field, scientists have identified more than 1,000 animal species, and they suspect that at least another 1,000 are also living there, along with 100,000 microbial species. Virtually all of the creatures in the path of the mining operations will, of course, be killed in anything living on the surface of those nodules removed from the ecosystem. The nodule harvesting machines as large as wheat combines will stir up towering clouds of sediment likely to drift for thousands of miles before finally setting on, settling onto burying and so killing yet more sea life. To recap, in America, the Saudi Arabia of green greed, we now covet a couple of medicals, medicals, a couple of metals critically important to the electric vehicle industry, cobalt and lithium, the reserves of which are concentrated in only a small number of nations. How 
However, the ores can be sucked straight off the seabed in humongous quantities in places far outside the jurisdiction of any nation. Environmentally, geopolitically, militarily, what could possibly go wrong? Plenty, of course. Writing for the Center of International Maritime Security last year, U.S. Coast Guard Surface Warfare Officer Lieutenant Kyle Craig argued that the Coast Guard and Navy should have a high-profile presence in seabed mining areas. He stressed that the 1980 Deep Seabed Hard Mineral Resource Act quote, claimed the right of the U.S. to mine the seabed in international waters and specifically identifies the Coast Guard as responsible for enforcement, close quote. He did acknowledge <clears throat> that patrolling areas where deep sea mining occurs could create some dicey situations. As he put it, the Coast Guard will face the same problem the U.S. Navy does with its freedom of navigation operations in places like the South China Sea. Quote, but by potentially putting their vessels in harm's way, he wrote, the services seek to reinforce the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea as reflecting customary international law, close quote. Forget the fact that the U.S. has never even signed on to the Law of the Sea Treaty. Craig then predicted that, quote, among the most challenging in a future seabed competition would be China and Russia, states that have already used lawfare in the South China Sea and Arctic regions, respectively, to pursue their territorial gains. Close quote. To make matters worse, seafloor mining might not only spark military conflict, but also become an integral part of war fighting itself. Mana Bratha Guha, a researcher in war theory at the University of New South Wales, to told Australia's ABC television network that data, including topographic or thermal maps of the seabed, obtained through exploration of the seafloor by mining operation projects could be of great value to the nation's armed forces. According to ABC, quote, just 9% of the ocean floor is mapped in high resolution compared to about 99% of the surface of Mars a blind spot that affects both deep sea miners and military planners. This is all worth keeping in mind because while the Pacific Ocean is set to be the sea with the most mining potential, it is also home to this century's most consequential geopolitical tension the rise of China and the U.S.'s response to it, close quote. And now they get to the South China Sea, which I have been saying for years, I'm betting on the dark horse that the South China Sea is where World War III is going to erupt. I'm still sticking to my guns on this, that the China, South China Sea, and if it doesn't start there, you better believe it will be part of World War III at the very least. <clears throat> the resource-rich South 
China Sea in particular, notes ABC, has long been a potential flashpoint between China and America. As Guha speculated, U.S. use of deep sea data in the region, quote, could be expanded beyond its battle-centric focus to also include attacks on civilian infrastructure, finance, and cultural systems. He added, quote, the undersea domain provides another vector, another potential hole that the Americans would look to penetrate, thanks to the fact, as he pointed out, that the U.S is 20 to 30 years ahead of China in undersea mapping technology. Uh, quote, you want to pick and choose where you hurt the adversary to such an extent that their whole system collapses. That is the idea of multi-domain warfare. The idea is to bring about systemic collapse, close quote, and I'm certainly thinking they're doing an excellent job of bringing about systemic collapse. Systemic collapse? Really? Instead of devising techniques to take down other societies in this increasingly heated moment, Shouldn't we be focusing on how to avoid our own systemic collapse? A national fleet of battery-powered cars is unlikely to prove sustainable and could have catastrophic consequences globally. It is time to consider an overhaul of the entire transportation system to move it away from a fixation on personal vehicles and toward walking, pedaling, and a truly effective nationwide public transportation system. Yeah, 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 right. Which could indeed be run on electricity while helping to avoid future disastrous <clears throat> resource wars. Such a transformation, even if it, even were it to occur, would of course take a long time. During that period, electric vehicles will continue to be manufactured in quantity. So, for now, to reduce their impact on humanity and the Earth, America should aim to produce fewer and far smaller vehicles than the ones currently planned. After all, electrified versions of the big-ass trucks and SUVs of the present moment will also require bigger, heavier batteries like the one in the F-150 Lightning pickup truck which weighs the battery which weighs 1,800 pounds and is the size of two mattresses. They will, of course, contain proportionally larger quantities of cobalt, lithium, and copper. And just an aside here, I don't know if you've read these hilarious stories about the F-150 Lightning pickup truck, that they can't tow anything. They're absolutely worthless to tow anything. The main reason being the damn battery weighs 1,000 800 pounds, worthless as a towing vehicle. The true burden of a massive battery in an electric car or truck will be borne not just by the vehicle's suspension system, but by the people 
and ecosystems unlucky enough to be in or near the global supply chain that will produce it. And those people may be among the first of millions to be imperiled by a new wave of geopolitical and military conflicts in what should be thought of as the world's green sacrifice zones. <laughs> the green sacrifice zones. I think sacrifice zones is Chris Hedge's term. So now we can add green sacrifice zones and green resource wars to uh, the glossary of the collapse. So I'm going to wrap this up and uh, is that a ray of sunshine coming through? And uh, I might actually come back with some uh, little short, shorter snippets because uh, I have tiny house fever. Get out there and enjoy your resource, resource wars. Well, you still can. Bye, guys.